Hello and welcome to this podcast on cells, form, and function. Thanks for joining. Today I'd like to really just kind of go over the basic ways that the cell is built and what it can do. So the word form is really about how is the shape, the structure of the cell built, and function is really describing what are the different processes or things that cells can do. So as we dive into this study of cells and cell biology for this unit, it's very important that you understand the basic layout of how the cell is built and understand that not all cells are in fact the same. We have plant cells, we have animal cells, and even within our own bodies as, uh, as animals, there are hundreds if not thousands of different kinds of cells that allow our bodies to do various things. For example, there are pancreatic cells that produce insulin that helps usher sugar cell, uh, molecules into cells. There are heart cells and muscle cells that help to um, power our, our, our bodies and move blood through our uh, vascular system. Skeletal muscles uh, themselves are uh, responsible for moving our bodies from place to place. We have fat cells which store energy for times when we need it. So as you can see that our bodies are very, very diverse in the things that um, are used to build them. And so the building blocks in a basic sense are our cells. So when we're doing notes, what I'd like for you to do is to follow the format of the Cornell note taking. And you'll see as the graphic shows that it's basically structured into three areas. There's the uh, note taking area, which is where you're going to be writing down key ideas or important points that um, you'll hear in this podcast or in a lecture that you might hear in uh, my class. The Q column that you'll see in blue is basically an area where you'd write down the major ideas. So for example, if a lecture has four main ideas, then you would write each of them in this Q column, for example, in this space right here, and then to the right you would just make a list of the various subpoints that go to this main idea. At the very end of each lecture, you'll see in the summary section, this is where you kind of write the, the big idea, or if you imagine that you're taking the Google Earth perspective at 30,000 feet and kind of just basically saying, in hindsight, in the river mirror, this is what I took away from this particular lecture. So it's very important that uh, students do this because it's only through our own words and through us phrasing or framing what we learn in language that we use and understand, that's really where you're taking the short-term information that you get through a lecture or through a speech, something that you've heard, and you transfer that to your long-term area. At the top of the uh, lecture, you want to include the title, which is Cells, Form, and Function, and then make sure the date's there. And this will be very important as you go back through and, and you're reviewing for a quiz or a test. And as we fast forward to the end of the year for the uh, end of the year finals, at, if you're diligent and organized and keeping up with this format, it'll make it very much easier for you to review for those uh, assessments that will be somewhat removed from the time that you first um, heard this lecture or a podcast or, or whatever format that is taking place. So as we look at this video, you'll see that this plant water organism called paramecium has in one cell all of the structures that it needs to to really fight the environment or to take care of all of its all of its cellular needs. You'll notice that surrounding the outside of this cell it has these finger-like projections called cilia, which helps it to move and also to move uh, water and also uh, sediment and, and microorganisms that it eats toward its mouth. You'll see that the inside of this or this cell has uh, different structures that allow it to do various things. If we make the connection to say this cell and uh, the human body, the human body has uh, organs and organ systems that do specialized functions. So when we start looking at cell organelles, which really means little organs, there really is sort of a connection between how a cell relies on the cell structures called organelles, just like the human body relies on the organs to do their jobs. And so without all these organelles working properly, a cell really will fail in its ability to just meet the challenges that life has to offer. In terms of those challenges, really the problems that cells solve are very much the same problems that an organism will solve. So you can see from this graphic from top to bottom, um, organelles uh, provide the ability to turn uh, raw food into energy. 
uh, when they do that food processing, they get rid of waste. For example, they get rid of um, gases like carbon dioxide, for example, if we're talking about an animal cell or if we're talking about a plant cell, plants get rid of the waste product of O2, which is um, the product of uh, photosynthesis. Um, on the flip side, organisms need to, to breathe. And so for uh, animal case, we need to breathe in oxygen. Plants need to breathe, breathe in CO2. Um, over time, uh, life um, has a way of causing damage to our cell parts, and so new parts have to be made. We need certain chemicals. Uh, for example, we need sugars to turn that into energy. We need amino acids in our diet to make proteins. We're going, we're going to go through all these in, in future po podcasts. But basically, we need uh, foodstuffs so that we are powering our bodies to do the things that we need it to do. Um, balancing water level. Um, obviously, water is, an, uh, is a key ingredient to life. Uh, NASA scientists that are looking for extraterrestrial organisms are, in fact, looking for other planets, whether they be moons or, or planets themselves that have water. Uh, they need to respond to their environment. Organisms and, and cells, for that matter, are not sort of static or unchanging, but they're always sort of um, sensing what's going on in their environment and then responding so that they can survive and, and, and adapt. And then lastly is the, the picture of the rabbits, and it indicates all organisms must reproduce. And so this is true on the cell level, and it's also true on the organism level. So as we go through this uh, sort of tour of the cell, uh, keep in mind that all of these structures, while, while they may be remote or unfamiliar to you, or they may have weird sounding names, um, they all have very specific roles to play. And when all of them do their job together and do that well, then these problems that are listed will be really a piece of cake. So the big picture, two things I'd like for you to know and remember, and maybe this would be one of the kind of the summary pieces, is understand that cells have certain structures that perform specific jobs. And so earlier I had mentioned the word organelle, which really means little organ. And so every cell has a variety of these organelles that really do the life functions for the cell. And then secondly, cells closely monitor and control their functions or activities. So cells must always be on the lookout for things in the environment that may cause um, a challenge for them to live, or uh, even in some cases, uh, single cell organisms have to seek food and eat other things, or they themselves become food. And so oftentimes, single cell organisms are the bottom of the food chain. And so it's very important for you to be aware of those things that want to eat you, or be on the lookout for things that you can eat, since um, energy is really a requirement for all cells. So some quick definitions. So organelle is basically a structure within a specialized, uh, excuse me, a structure with a specialized function within the cell. Uh, that would include things like the nucleus and the rough ER, etc. Uh, eukaryote, if you break that word down, U, EU just means true. Karyo means kernel. And so the first uh, microscopic images of cells, of eukaryotic cells, actually had a visible what they thought was a kernel, we know that as the nucleus right now. So a eukaryotic cell basically has membranes around all of their organelles, and then specifically uh, a nucleus with DNA inside. And it generally is about 10 times the size of a prokaryotic cell. A prokaryotic cell, pro means first, karyo means kernel. So this would be the cells that existed prior to the eukaryotic cells uh, coming on the scene. And so these are typically bacterial cells. They are about 10 times smaller than eukaryotic cells. They don't have any organelles with membranes, and so they're very simple in their design. As we'll show in this podcast and in future podcasts, um, bacteria are very common, but they're very successful despite the fact that they're very simple cells. When we look at cells in a general sense, and, and actually in, in a lab that's coming up in, in just a short while, uh, you'll have a chance to examine different kinds of cells. Uh, several of them will be plant cells, and we'll be looking at actually a uh, uh, cheek cell that uh, you'll harvest and stain and be able to pick out the, the key pieces. So basically, if we look at animal cells, plant cells, bacterial cells, um, there are basically 16 different organelles that do different things, and it's in those organelles that you'll need to understand what they do. So it'll really be a matching of the organelle and its function. 
Uh, the first organelle that I want to introduce you to is the cell membrane. So the way that these si slides are set up, the structure will be on the left side. The structure just means how is this thing, this structure made, and typically what kinds of materials is it made from. And then the function is basically what does it do. So in this case, the cell membrane, the structure is basically fat molecules, and you'll see that these structures here, this gray head here, is really kind of a mirror image of these, and then we have these little black legs. They're called uh, the tails of the of the fat molecule. So basically, we have one layer of fat on the bottom side, and we have one layer of fat on the top side. And as this shows, the lipid is the gray circle here with the two tails. And the function is it's basically a boundary layer, so it's a fence around the cell in a sense, and allows certain things to go through the cell membrane. For example, from the outside toward the inside or from the inside toward the outside. And any membrane allows some things to pass through but not everything is called selectively permeable. So it lets some but not all things pass through. And this will be important uh, for just determining what things can enter the cell and what things leave the cell. The cell membrane in this picture you'll see is highlighted by number seven and the cell membrane is actually the entire outer piece of this cell. If we took this cell and we chopped it in half as this picture shows, it's just the boundary layer around the cell that really protects it from the outside environment. It really defines what's inside versus what's outside. Uh, just as a note, this line right here does not represent the cell membrane, but rather um, some other part, perhaps the cytoskeleton. So just remember that it's the outside. And it's this picture that you're going to see in uh, future quizzes and assessments. So I just become very familiar with this picture in linking the, the names of the, of the organelles with their structures. The cell wall is the second structure. Uh, this is found uh, uniquely in plant cells. And this is basically um, an additional layer that separates the outside of the plant cell from the inside environment. Um, in addition to that ability to contain what's inside and versus what's outside, there's a very stiff material called cellulose. Cellulose is actually what helps to make trees rigid or the, the fibers of grass. Um, that's what they're made of is cellulose. And they have this sort of layered effect where it's just sort of cellulose superimposed on cellulose in a kind of a crisscross fashion and then when that layering happens it actually increases the strength of the, of the cell wall. The cells um, themselves allow materials to pass through. There's these microscopic pores that actually have cut through the cell wall. You'll see right here this is actually a picture of an onion cell and this sort of dark staining yellow here that I'm following with the cursor that's actually the cell wall. And so by extension cells that have a cell wall are more brick-like, whereas those cells that lack a cell wall tend to be more circular or they can have some irregular shapes. You'll notice here in the center, this is that kernel, so this is a eukaryotic cell, and this is actually the nuclear membrane with the DNA inside of it, and then this white space, or relatively white space, is actually the cytoplasm. We'll look at those in just a minute. So like the cell membrane, the cell wall can be permeable and it really kind of also provides the, the structural support so that the plant can actually remain upright and kind of grow vertically away from the ground. And you'll see in this picture the cell wall is sort of this sort of thick layer right here around the, the cutaway here. And so you'll see this yellow line is the cell membrane and this is the cell wall. So the cell wall is always the outer layer. And they're sort of sandwiched together where it would be really difficult to separate the two from each other. Uh, the vacuole has um, basically a storage function. Vacuoles can be found in both animal cells or plant cells. However, the function is different. For cell wall, for excuse me, plant cells, the vacuole actually fills up with water and it helps the cell to kind of be really rigid and kind of stiff. Um, in animal cells, however, the cell wall is sort of like a refrigerator where it holds food or sometimes it can hold uh, waste products prior to being uh, released from the cell. And again, in the picture of the plant cell, you'll notice that second only to the nucleus, which is right here, the vacuole is the largest organelle in the cell. So it's going to be the 
most easily seen thing in this cutaway you can see that it has this blue interior indicating that it's filled with water so when plants lose water for example in the summertime when it's really hot people aren't watering their plants the vacuole will shrink and as a result the cells will get a little bit more sort of uh, flimsy or not as rigid and so they'll tend to kind of droop so you can sell you can tell pretty quickly those plants that have been watered recently uh, vacuole location in an animal cell is a little bit different in that this right here again it's just a storage uh, kind of location for food um, it is much smaller in comparison okay number four the nucleus uh, its structure basically it's made up of DNA and DNA is basically packaged in chromatin so if you've ever sent anything or if your parents have sent anything in the mail that has been maybe fragile and they put the packing peanuts in there the chromatin really is um, kind of a packaging material that helps to keep the fragile DNA molecule from being damaged uh, and then that floats in a fluid called the nucleoplasm and again that's another sort of um, supporting material for the for the DNA uh, the function basically it's the the master of the cell in terms of what happens in the cell you can think of it as the godfather or the president of the cell um, so anything that happens in the cell is always directed by the action of the nucleus and it is um, involved in cell division because when one cell becomes two all of the chromosomes or the sort of packages of DNA in the nucleus have to double and so in our cells we have uh, 23 pairs of chromosomes or 46 total and those 46 chromosomes actually double into 92 and then those 92 split down the middle when one cell becomes two you'll see as I mentioned earlier the location and the size of the nucleus makes it a really easy structure to point out in a future lab that we're going to be doing looking at uh, at uh, cell diversity plant cells versus animal cells it's really the plant cell or the animal cell nucleus the cytoplasm and the cell wall slash cell membrane which are really the only things that we're going to be able to see under the microscope so you're not going to be able to see some a lot of these other pieces like number 10 which is the vacuole and number 5 which is the rough ER or number 6 which is the Golgi apparatus you're not going to see those so really the focus is on the the big things in that lab the nuclear membrane is, is like the cell membrane because it is the defining sort of fence or barrier around the nucleus and you'll see that in this picture right here um, this INM stands for the inner nuclear membrane and then the ONM stands for the outer nuclear membrane so it's a, it's a two layer structure you'll also notice that there are some holes right here that are called pores, nuclear pores and this actually allows for materials to get into and out of the, the nucleus and you'll notice that um, in this white structure this is actually the chromatin which is kind of wrapped around the fragile DNA so again it is selectively permeable because it allows some things but not everything to pass through that membrane again you'll see number two item is pointing to the nuclear membrane which is the outer covering of the nucleus uh, the nucleolus is um, often confused with the nucleus the nucleolus is actually a structure within the nucleus and it's basically made of a kind of RNA and DNA and proteins and we'll be looking at a specific like structure and function of RNA and DNA and what those are and what they do uh, so for now just understand that it's the home for RNA and DNA and it actually builds ribosomes and later on in this podcast you'll hear that ribosomes are the factory in which amino acids are turned into proteins so it is a very very important thing and it's found within the nucleus itself so if you look at this picture it's actually number one item it has sort of this purplish hue here um, and it kind of stands out some people mistake it for the nucleus but it's actually the nucleolus number seven chromatin as I mentioned before uh, DNA is a very very long very fragile molecule and and if DNA gets damaged then that's a bad thing we call that a mutation and genetically speaking if mutations um, are severe enough that can cause uh, birth disorders, birth defects, um, various kinds of illnesses. So it's very, very important that the DNA be protected. And so that's really the main function of the chromatin. And you'll sometimes see chromatin and sometimes not. It's, it's visible 
um, in, in some stages of the cell cycle, uh, but um, that's not as important right now. So understand that it is the protector of the DNA. And the chromatin in this picture is not clearly any one location. Just understand that it sort of spread evenly throughout the nucleus. Um, in this picture, or this cartoon of onion cells, you'll see that um, there's these dark spots in the center of the nucleus. You'll see them here, and you'll see them here, you'll see them here, and they look different because really what these dark spots are showing is DNA being either replicated or copied. So for example, you'll see in this cell right here, we have one, two bits of DNA, and this is actually ready to, to split. Uh, you'll see in this cell right here, we have DNA material here, you have DNA material here, it's actually being pulled to either side of the, the cell, and so this is actually just before cell division happens. And so the, the dark staining uh, effect is actually the chromatin that can be seen. And so there are times in the cell cycle when it's not actively dividing, and then you would not be able to see the chrom chromatin. Now here's a uniquely plant cell structure. So a chloroplast is basically a uh, sugar factory. Uh, its main job is to absorb sunlight and convert that sunlight energy with oxygen, with CO2 and with water and turn it into oxygen and um, glucose, which is um, our sugar foods that we eat. So for example, if you eat potatoes uh, or fruits, the sugars contained in those um, we derive energy from. And so it's the site of photosynthesis. Uh, it is green, and that green pigment is from a molecule called chlorophyll. There's chlorophyll A and chlorophyll B, and those are just two different pigment molecules that allow this organelle to absorb uh, sunlight. So you'll understand that, uh, that a little bit more deeply as we go into that process a little bit later. And again, you'll see in this inset picture that the uh, chloroplast is actually this green kind of football-shaped structure right here. And you'll um, commonly see uh, many of these, um, you know, tens, twenties uh, of these. And again, it's very important that plant cells have plenty of these because without them, no sugar is made, the plant cell dies, and then we as animals that consume the sugars made by them would also die. Uh, the centriole, this is actually um, sort of not prominent in most people's thoughts about cells, but they do a very um, important job. They actually are kind of the movers and shakers of the chromosomes. In the uh, previous uh, slide showing the different uh, cartoon versions of the onion cell going through cell division, the chromosomes actually move um, to and fro by the assistance of these uh, centrioles. And so you'll see that the structure, they to me look like long um, sort of manicotti uh, pastas or maybe long spaghettis that all kind of radiate around this common center here. And they're always in pairs, and so they, their job is kind of moving things from point A to point B in the cell, um, mostly DNA, but also other things. And you'll see, again, there's this pairing right here. That's the classic look of the centriole. So if you're taking a quiz and you're matching up um, names of organelles to what they look like, then that's a pretty easy one to, to pick out. So here's number 10, we're, we're going to number 16, that's when we'll end. So 10 is what's called the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, that's a mouthful to say. So most people call it the smooth ER or the SER. And basically they are these um, very extensive um, sort of channels of membranes and they are involved in moving chemicals from point A to point B, oftentimes as the chemicals are being, being manufactured and sort of changed, modified. Uh, tweaked, if you will, as they're heading down to the final uh, assembly kind of stage. And then a lot of chemical reactions happen at the smooth ER. So for example, when individuals consume alcohol, it's the smooth endoplasmic reticulum in their liver cells that actually help to detoxify or to make less toxic the alcohol. And so um, people that have um, alcohol-related um, liver damage because the um, endoplasmic reticulum of their cells has actually been overworked and um, they have what's called fatty liver. Um, so uh, it's the SCR that's involved in uh, these two things. And you'll see the picture here uh, noted by number eight. Um, it has these kind of tube-like structures 
that um, are smooth and by that we mean that there's no dots here like it is on the rough ER which I'm pointing to right here so it's it's ER it's endoplasmic reticulum it's just smooth in that it doesn't have these dots so if you're looking for identifying SER just look for the channels that um, are basically naked the rough ER by contrast has these um, little dots on those we call those dots ribosomes and the ribosomes actually help to make um, long chain uh, proteins from amino acids and they like the SER are these, these sort of networks of membranes and they also move chemicals from point A to point B so the major difference between the SER and the RER is that the RER also is a location for making proteins and so you'll see that from the point of the nucleus the next sort of organelle in line would be the rough ER and then products from the rough ER actually get transferred to the smooth ER and then oftentimes from the smooth ER they actually get shipped to this structure here called the Golgi body. And you'll see here that um, there's that sort of studded or textured uh, surface to the rough ER and you'll see right here that there's this sort of channel or passageway between the nucleus internal environment and the rough ER so they are connected so the question is if they do have uh, if they don't have ribosomes then they're the smooth ER and if they do have ribosomes then they're the rough ER uh, so the ribosome itself so here's a picture of a bacterial cell and you'll see that it has a very thick cell wall it has a cell membrane it has something called a flagellum which is the bacterial tail and as I said before prokaryotic cells are different than eukaryotic cells in that prokaryotic cells are generally about 10 times smaller they have no membrane bound organelles and they don't really have a proper nucleus in this picture you'll see that these green structures are actually the ribosomes and so very much um, prokaryotic cells and eukaryotic cells must make proteins so it would make sense for both of them to have ribosomes and so basically a ribosome is a kind of RNA which is ribonucleic acid and it's just the, uh, they're basically the assembly site of the uh, protein manufacturing. Ribosome locations, they can either be free or bound. So if they are connected to, say, for example, the RER, they're called uh, bound ribosomes. And if they're free, then they're just going to be freely floating throughout this space called the cytoplasm. And they can build proteins um, really anywhere. The Golgi apparatus, some people call it the Golgi body, uh, this is sort of the end of the line for processing of chemicals and proteins and molecules that are made in the cell. Pre excuse me, previously, I had mentioned that oftentimes the beginning of that process is the nucleus, and the nucleus then feeds material to the rough ER, then to the SER, and then this is usually the final stop. So any sort of last minute changes. Um, two chemicals actually happen here um, and then this is sort of the the launch point for materials that would end up, end up being released from the cell this is sort of the last sort of step in that process so I kind of think of the Golgi apparatus as like the UPS where they they pack they, they 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 modify or they sort of tweak and then they ship and that's really what UPS does in terms of sending out packages you know all over the world the Golgi body is really about receiving products, modifying those, packaging them, and then shipping them out. Because oftentimes one cell is involved in the job of making materials that will be actually sent to other parts of the body. So for example, um, in a lot of your endocrine glands, um, like for example your adrenal gland or, t or the testes or the ovaries, um, they produce chemicals like called hormones that are used outside of those cells and so they're in the business of actually making materials so you'll see in this picture here number six this structure here usually the items come through what's called the the trans phase which is the back side and then as they are passed through these sort of folds they're being changed modified and then they'll emerge on this facing side called the cis side and then they'll actually be shipped out of the cell through what's called a, a vesicle which is a kind of a small bubble uh, made of um, membrane. Number 14 mitochondria 
Uh, this is basically the organelle that converts sugar energy into ATP energy, which is basically what your body needs to do really anything, whether it's uh, moving your muscles or, or speaking or uh, thinking about something, studying, really everything requires ATP energy. So you'll see at the bottom of the screen, cell respiration reaction, glucose goes in, oxygen goes in, that's why we breathe in oxygen. And then when this process is completed, then the mitochondria will release carbon dioxide. It makes a bit of water, and it makes a whole lot of energy in the, a in the form of ATP. ATP stands for adenosine triphosphate. And it's that sort of um, temporary energy molecule that's kind of like a battery, where the battery is juiced up, ready to go. But you just need to plug it into that device, and it'll be ready to, to release the energy. Mitochondria locations, you'll see here picture number nine. Essentially, to me, they look like jelly beans, uh, and they have uh, kind of a double membrane. So they have an outer membrane right here, and then they have this sort of infolding, uh, which is the secondary membrane. It's really in this space right there in that mitochondria where something called cell respiration happens, which is the conversion of oxygen and glucose into carbon dioxide, water, and energy. A lysosome, a lysosome is basically the sort of the food disposal of the of the cell. And so basically it is this sort of membrane kind of bag in a way, and inside that they have these special enzymes that kind of break down material. And so uh, most of the time it's actually sort of um, waste or, or things that really shouldn't belong in the cell, that the cell just basically kind of just degrades into its like smallest parts and then ships it out. So they break up food molecules as well, and um, that's basically the function of the lysosome. And so like this Pac-Man molecule, it's about eating stuff, breaking stuff down. And so here, number four is pictured as the uh, location of the lysosome. And then the last but not least is the microtubules slash microfilament, so MT or MF. Both of those are collectively called the cytoskeleton. So um, Animal cells that don't have a cell wall that allow them to be sort of rigid and kind of stiff, um, cytoskeleton actually performs the same function in the cell as our bones do in our body. And so without the cytoskeleton, you can imagine that the normally kind of spherical, uh, kind of balloon-shaped uh, cell actually collapse. Um, yes, it is true that there is water in the cell. However, in addition to the water, the cytoskeleton is kind of helping to kind of keep it in its sort of three-dimensional shape. And then another important function of the cytoskeleton is that actually it's sort of like train tracks where items are moved from point A to point B in the cell by way of these cytoskeleton. And so they have sort of two functions. So that kind of concludes the, the tour of the cell. And we're gonna be looking at um, some of these in, in greater detail in the future, but uh, hopefully this has been helpful for you. Thanks.